Hey everyone, Amanda here. Just a little bit of a content warning heads up. Today we talk a little bit about some terrorist acts, some Islamophobia and racism. And I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that and there is going to be some specific racist language that I talk about in my piece. But I do hope you listen because these women have incredible stories that are definitely worth hearing. Enjoy. Hi there, guys. Hello, everyone. This is Rita. This is Amanda. And you're listening to I I Don't Don't Know Know Her, the podcast where you talk about women you've probably never heard of, but you should should have. have. And And now, today you will. (laughs) (laughs) We're trying new things here. We are. We like new things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been a tough week. It has been. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've, uh, the last, by the way, just to recap for last week, we talked about breast milk. We did. We learned some things. It is normal. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the name of it. It was called like... It was something weird. It kind of sounded like diarrhea, but yeah, it wasn't it ended diarrhea. With, <laughs> it ended with Rhea, for sure. It ended with Rhea. Um, it's, so any ladies who are out there who are too afraid to ask a friend, um, I we researched it and <laughs> hardcore researched it, and it is normal. 100%. 100% normal. And it's also normal for it to just poof, go away. So Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And the one woman we were reading the story of, like, hers still hasn't gone away. And her yeah. oldest kid is 21. I know. And I was like, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. So And the one went away and then it came back. And yeah. Like, what? <laughs> so yours could come back? No, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep you guys informed. <laughs> so uh, we, we have had a little bit of a tough week, though. Um, the news has been a little rough. Yeah. Besides the impeachment shit, which is going well. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if our listeners have been paying much attention, but this last week there's been a case at the Supreme Court that was argued about whether or not it is legal to fire somebody for being LGBTQ. Yeah. Yeah. And that was Title Eight. Well, they're using the... Um, that if you can't... There's, discriminate based on sex Mm, then you shouldn't be able to discriminate based on gender identity or sexual orientation Mm -hmm. so we won't know the they will announce their decision i don't know when Mm -hmm. any day now maybe but just the idea that there are people debating my rights (laughs) yeah in 2019 yeah that's pretty shitty Mm -hmm. and it's not looking good based on the um the questioning from the justices. So that's devastating. That's and uh, such a giant step backwards. It really is. And this week is, in case you didn't know, everybody, Friday, October 11th was National Coming Out Day. Mm-hmm. It's a 30, it was the 31st celebration, 31st annual celebration of National Coming Out Day. This has been around for quite some time, literally most of my life. Mm-hmm. So you would think that maybe by this point it was pretty commonplace and not a big deal yeah and celebrated yeah and celebrated especially by those who you know it's their right to celebrate Mm -hmm. this week i run the gsa at my school and this week we decided to do a coming out event um we had talked about doing something that was community oriented so what our students decided to do was a community art project that everybody could participate in And so you could come out as LGBTQ or come out as a supporter, come out as an ally, just come out. Mm -hmm. And so one of our students uh, acquired a canvas and painted the trunk and branches of a tree. And then I purchased rainbow colored stamps and the students could put their leave, uh (laughs) pun, leave their mark um, using their fingers or thumbs or whatever, make fingerprints or thumbprints on it as leaves on the tree and we we ended up with lots and lots of fingerprints i mean it was probably 200 of them oh wow it was great it was great but the whole entire day was kind of marred by a situation that has 
I, I kind of talked about earlier in an episode a few weeks ago mm-hmm. about um, a group of students who had decided they wanted to start a straight club, which, as I had said to Rita before, was likely to not really go anywhere. Mm-hmm. But because of National Coming Out Day, of course, we were advertising our event on the announcements and on the TV screens. So the students were obviously aware that it was happening. Mm -hmm. Because of that awareness, some of those students who wanted to start the straight club decided to pass around um, messages, private messages, invitation-only messages to students inviting just them to come to a quote-unquote straight club meeting uh, during the time when our GSA kids would be having people participate in the art project, Mm -hmm. which was, as you can imagine, disheartening. Yeah. Purposefully hurtful. Yes. 100% intentional. For sure. Yeah. And of course, um, you know, teenagers are the best niches. (laughs) (laughs) And so I had three different kids within the space of probably 10 minutes run in with a screenshot on their phone. Oh, nice. <laughs> to show it to me, to be like, this is happening. And I had already alerted the administration in the best way that I could figure out how at that moment, because it was literally 7.30. And that's when the kids were supposed to be meeting. So it's like, I can't leave where I'm at. I need somebody else to go check in on this. And no one ever got back to me all day hmm. about it. So I, um, from what I understand... Most of our administration was tied up with another big problem involving a fight, perhaps. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least that's what the students said. And then um, another teacher was able to get a hold of somebody else who went into the gym and sort of broke up the situation. Yeah. The straight club. But um, throughout the rest of the day, as the GSA kids were manning their table, these straight club kids kept walking by them and circling them and passing by and it's lunchtime there's an administrator standing in front of them so one of the sort of I guess moments of tension that we've had in the last year is that the administration keeps saying that we're not bringing it to their attention Mm -hmm. but sometimes I just want to tell them how about you open your fucking eyes (laughs) you're standing right there help them (laughs) these children need your help and support. Yes. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was just a really disheartening whole situation. There was also a student who commented on the GSA Instagram page and said stuff about how we're pushing an agenda. And, you know, it's, I mean, like the same talking points you've been hearing for 30 fucking years. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, you know, I kept thinking, why is this still exactly the same way as it was when I was struggling to come out in college 15 fucking years ago? Well, I would imagine those people that treated you the way they treated you now have 15-year-old children. That's true. Yep. And, you know, apple tree. (laughs) No kidding. Yeah, and that's... I think definitely why I, and I explained to my son why it's important to be supportive and why it's important to be an ally. And it's important because I don't want him to see something like that and not be able to do nothing, do and do nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, inaction speaks louder than action. Exactly. Like you, I always, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that MLK talked about. The white moderates, right? Mm -hmm. Who sit by and tell everybody to be nice and then not do anything. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's like, okay, you can be nice, but what now? Yeah, what now? What are you going to do about it? What are your actions going to be? That was like that. You remember that one time we were on the podcast talking about that blogger who um, somebody had said, you know, it's not nice to call out that troll. And she was like, oh, I'm... Or is the I think the commenter said you're you're not being kind and she was like, Oh no, I am being kind. Kindness does not mean that you lay down and let people walk all over you. Kindness exactly. means that you see an injustice in the world and you point it out and you let everybody know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, That's great. 
Well, I, you know, my heart goes out to you and, and those kids. The kids. They're, they're children, you know. I know they are teenagers and they're young adults, but they're still someone's child. They're a person. Um, if I was there, I'd be like, I love you, <laughs> you know. I want to show my support. And it just fucking pisses me off that there's little pricks out there that have nothing better to do than to still just do this stupid shit. It's so frustrating because these kids are just trying to carve out a space in the world that belongs to them. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking earlier about, um, you know, straight pride. The world is straight pride. Mm -hmm. You get every fucking day. You get everything else. Like we get this one little space that we've carved out for ourselves. We get October 11th. Mm -hmm. We get April whatever for the day of silence. And we get June for pride. And that's because we've, created those spaces for ourselves your life can continue without ever recognizing those days yeah. it's just frustrating that they that they're the ones inserting their bullshit into our lives and our spaces mm-hmm. and then saying it's our fault yeah no no you went out of your way to walk around that kid's table you went out of your way to create a competing club without a an endorsement from the administration you were the one sending out clandestine messages we didn't do any of that shit. Not the, yeah, exactly. These other we kids followed are the not rules. doing that. Yeah. So you tell me who the one is that's pushing an agenda. Exactly. Okay. Rant over. All right. <laughs> well, happy National Coming Out Day on Friday. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And to you too. Yeah. And anybody out there, you know, out or still in, you know, we celebrate you. And uh, Rita had a similar situation happen this week because Anne McLean, a Spokane native, G Prep alumni, mm-hmm. Gonzaga Prep, which is a, a preparatory high school, college prep high school here. It's Catholic. It's where my son goes to school. Um, they had invited Anne McLean, an astronaut. If you haven't ever heard of her, she's very famous. And she's from here, so it's like a big deal. Oh, she's a local celebrity. Yeah. And um, she was supposed to be part of that all female spacewalk. That got canceled because they didn't have enough uniforms that fit women. <laughs> so it was her and um, the other astronaut's name was Nick. I, I learned that from her speech. <laughs> oh. So um, she came to talk. And in the days leading up to it, she was also kind of over the summer, there was like a little bit of a controversial thing that happened where she's in the middle of a divorce from her wife. And she had like looked at the bank account and knew where she was spending money and it turned into a very messy divorce very quickly, mm-hmm. which is it happens. a thing that happens. Yeah. And the when she was coming to speak, suddenly people were having a problem with that. Mm-hmm. And Rita can take it from there because she knows more okay. than I do. So uh, I, I received an email from the school, my, my son's school, which actually Anne McLean actually went to that school as well. And they said, you know, if you want your child to participate in seeing her speak, you have to sign them out and take them yourselves. There was no, because for field trips, they arrange buses and, you know, uh, other parents will take kids in their vans, you know, things like that. We get a permission slip and they didn't do it. We didn't know that we had been invited at all. And Gonzaga had invited every single school in the Catholic uh, diocese in the Catholic right? diocese to come and see her speak. And we didn't get the invitation and so I was like, what, what the hell's going on? And then I heard from other parents that, uh, and we received a second email too, that the board of governors decided that the children shouldn't be exposed to this because she had controversy surrounding her. And mm-hmm. it just, and they specifically said in the email that it wasn't because she was gay. And I was like, why would you say it if it didn't fucking matter? Yeah. You, you're you saying it by not saying it, you know? And a lot of parents were upset because they're like, we want our child to be able to see her speak. You know, she's a fascinating person. She's overwhelmingly successful and smart. And she's she's made history. She has. And she even had like videos of her in space. She had photos. She showed, you know, the International Space Station. And it was me and Nick were like, whoa. And it's like, these kids should be able to see that. And it's And so I told my husband, I was like, we're going. I was like, I want to show her support and we sat down with our son and told him why too we were like this is not okay and we want you to be able to go and he was like okay so you know we went it was wonderful she was really well received um 
like I said, the presentation was fantastic. And part of her speech was really awesome. She was talking about, um, she said, I really hope you kids see that there is no us in them. She said, we are all part of the human race. And she said, when I was in space and was looking down on the earth, I just realized, wow, we're all one. We're all one person, a human being. So we should just look at more of what we have in common than what we have different. And I thought that was really neat that she was sharing that message. Yeah, some of the kids I know should hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had a question for you when you were talking about that. Mm. Is it relatively common if GPEP's bringing in a big speaker and the other schools get invited? Is it common for like Cataldo to bring their kids um, as a field trip? Like, has that happened in the past? It's happened before. Yeah. We just have to do, uh, you know, they have to organize buses. Yeah, and, field trip and stuff. Field trip stuff. So when was the last time that that your student, your your son went? For last a time he was at prep was actually he got invited, but this was um, this was uh, two kids from each class were only invited. Oh, okay. And it was when they got to see Anne McLean actually in space, and they got to ask her. Oh, questions. and Eastside got to do that. Yeah, he was <gasps> one of two. How cool! I know, and. Uh, I don't know what they based that on. I think it might have been a raffle or something because they couldn't take all the students. Yeah. And uh, that was the last time he was there. But there is opportunities. There have been in the past where students, like the schools get invited because they're bringing in somebody really yeah. great and the schools go. Yeah. And this time they didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I thought. That's what I thought. The world today is really depressing. So let's talk about some non-depressing things. I have a really great inspirational woman who was an activist. How about you? I have a heroine. Uh, her story is a little sad. Oh. So should I go first so we can end on a happy note? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to do a little preemptive uh, about the subject matter of my lady. It does have to do with uh, terrorism. And it's a very, I, as I was doing the research for this subject, I was like getting uncomfortable because I was like, I don't want to add any fuel to, I feel an already, I'm trying to find the words, a stigma, you know, I don't yeah. want to villainize anybody and I don't want to add anything else that's already that been, people already think that people already think. And so well, as I'm going through this story, I really want to, you out there to know this is not what I'm trying to do. But this happened to this woman, and I feel like it's important to share her story. Okay. Well, I'll ask clarifying questions in case we need to. So my lady today is Nerja Banat. I don't know her. So she is nicknamed the heroine of the hijack. Oh. So it's actually Nirja. So Nirja Banat was born in Chadiga, India on September 7th in 1963. She was raised in Bombay, which now is present day Mumbai. And she was part of a Punjabi family. Her father was Harish Banat, a Bombay based journalist. And her mother was Rama Banat. And her mother was a homemaker. She was one of three. She had two brothers, Akil and Anish. And so being the only daughter, uh, her family gave her the nickname Lado, which means dear darling. She was very, I mean, they adored her. That's but cute. She was, you know, I, if anybody has been daddy's little girl kind of thing. Yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> My sister Rachel was. <laughs> I was more of a thorn in the side. Uh, she received early schooling at Sacred Heart Senior Secondary School. When her family moved to Bombay, she continued at, is said a Scottish school? So I'm like, what is a Scottish school? I couldn't figure that out. And I don't know if it was like a specialized education, but she ended up graduating from St. Xavier's College. Nirja was extremely beautiful. She was, and I'm going to show you her picture. She was gorgeous. At the age of, um, I heard one said 16, one said 18. So in between those later teen years, she was spotted by a Bombay-based uh, magazine talent scout. And she began modeling assignments. And she actually had a pretty successful uh, modeling career. She was like in TV mm. advertisements. She was in magazine advertisements. Um, she had a really good contract too, so she was making good money. In 1985, Nirja got married. Uh, this was an arranged marriage. And she moved out of her parents' home to the United Arab Emirates. 
sadly, this marriage was terrible. Oh, uh, no. Nirja was mentally, emotionally, and she was physically abused by her husband. He denied her any money so that she had to be completely dependent upon him. And he even went as far as, like, if she would piss him off, he would starve her. Oh, my God. Yeah. Like, he was extremely abusive. Well, if there is a hell, he's in it. Yeah. So within, like, months of the marriage, uh, Nirja contacts her family, and she tells her what, tells them what's going on, and they allow her to come back home. So she's able to leave her husband. And later that year, Nirja decided that she wanted to move on from her experience with her husband and start a new career. She applied to the Pan American World Airways for an air hostess flight attendant position. Yeah. And at this time, Pan Am was making selections for its first all Indian crew. Oh. Which was going uh, to Frankfurt to India routes. Oh, like Frankfurt, Germany to India and back? Yes. Okay. And so Nirja was chosen to be part of this crew. So she was part of the first all Indian crew. I'm sure the looks didn't hurt. (laughs) (laughs) Probably not. Because you you know that they used to, like Pan Am was especially bad for that. Like really, you had to be a certain look. You had to be very beautiful. She was gorgeous. Yeah, so like she they probably fit in quite well. If they if if the whoever man in charge didn't think you were beautiful, you were out of a job. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Ugh. Okay. So Nirja was chosen to be part of the crew, and she was sent to Miami, Florida, for training. She finished her training within two months, and after one year with Pan Am. Her performance was so good that she was promoted to what's called their senior purser, which is basically she's the head flight attendant. Oh, do they get paid more? Yep. Good. (laughs) (laughs) On September 5th, 1986, Nirja was the senior purser on the Pan Am Flight 73, which is heading to New York City. Yeah. The plane had two scheduled stopovers, one in Karichi in Pakistan The other was in Frankfurt in West Germany. The Boeing 747 plane was carrying 394 passengers. Mm -hmm. Those things are huge. Yep. It had 13 flight attendants, including Nirja, and three flight crew. Uh, There was a pilot, there was a co-pilot, and there was a flight engineer. When did you say 88? This was 86. 86. Okay, because I vaguely know this story only from like a TV movie I watched when I was a okay. child. <laughs> so the passengers aboard the plane uh, varied from 14 different countries. So while on the tarmac in Karichi, the plane was hijacked by four um, armed Palestinian men. They were part of what was called the Abu Nadal organization. Mm. And it was a Palestinian um, extremist and it was a nationalist military group. Oh, geez. Yes. And these when are bad I say dudes. that, these are bad people. And like I said, this is extremism to a T. So this group uh, to this day is actually one of the most extreme and unrelenting groups that came out of Palestine. Pal- Palestine? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. She's so nervous telling this, you guys. I don't think you. I've ever seen Rita this nervous. <laughs> This subject makes me nervous. Okay, can we, can we explore that. that for just a second? Why does it make you so nervous? What are you worried about? Um, well, because it when I first saw like what terrorism looked like, it was definitely September 11th, mm. and the aftermath and the racism and mm. the violence that happened the after that and the bigotry, it broke my heart. Yeah, Islamophobia is real. It is, and. I th- yeah, I think it's important to make a distinction between a group that's an extremist group that comes from a country that has been brushed with a broad stroke of Islamophobia. Mm-hmm. Obviously, thinking individuals know that not everyone from Palestine or from Arab countries in general are terrorists. There yeah. are terrorist organizations here, too. They're called mm-hmm. white supremacists. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and currently, they're bombing synagogues and shooting up black churches and yeah. you know, running over people at a protest march. So we got them, too. We got them, too. Yeah. I don't know. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. I think you don't have to worry as much as you're worrying. <laughs> Calm down, Rita. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the two of the hijackers were actually dressed in airport security clothes. They were able to drive up to the plane in a security van, like lookalike, without any question. They actually passed multiple points, security checkpoints, Mm. and they got through. 
Uh, the hijackers fired their guns in the air to scare uh, nearby workers away so they could have access to the plane. This is where their first two victims were killed. Um, two tarmac workers uh, were caught in the gunfire and were killed. Oh, God. So then they boarded the plane. They took control of it. They had guns. They had grenades. And they had explosives. Shit. Yeah. God, that would be terrifying. Their goal was to get uh, the flight crew to fly them to Cyprus to barter um, the hostages for Palestinian prisoners that were being held in Cyprus and in Israel. Okay. And there's a deeper route to to this terrorist group, but if you want to go ahead and research that, it's, I want to just do kind of her story and not go too deep into that. So Nirja, who was near the exit of the plane, she made a split decision to grab the cabin phone to call the cockpit and notify the flight crew that they were being hijacked by giving them a hijack code. At this moment, one of her crew said that she could have escaped through the exit, but she stayed. The flight crew was able to escape the plane through a hatch above the cockpit. They were able to slide down an escape rope and run to safety. So the hijackers... So the plane's still on the tarmac. The plane is on the tarmac. Okay. It's not in the air. Okay. So the hijackers had no flight experience whatsoever. Now the plane was grounded and also Nirja was in charge of the passengers and the crew. So the chain of command, she's Mm -hmm. the one that's in charge now. Yeah. So once it was realized that there was no flight crew, the hijackers decided to start negotiating with officials who showed up and surrounded the plane. So the passengers were ordered to gather all in the center of the plane. They kind of like pushed them all together, made them crumple together. So people were like sitting on top of each other and sitting in the aisles and sitting on the ground and yeah as Uh, if it's not bad enough now you're like being forced to have close proximity to people when you're already feeling probably pretty claustrophobic yeah so during the negotiations the hijackers demanded a new flight crew and one of the passengers was shot and thrown out of the door as a warning of what they were willing to do if they didn't get what they wanted So Nirja was ordered to collect all of the passports from the passengers. Specifically, they wanted to identify all of the Americans who were on the plane. Nirja tells her crew to gather the passports, but whispers to them not to collect any American passports. So as they're going through, they're collecting... Don't collect any American passports? Yeah. What they want to do is they think that the Americans are more of a... Bargaining bargaining chip? chip. Yeah. So as they collected the passports, they would toss the American passports under the seats, and Nirja even was able to throw some in the garbage. There were 43 Americans on board, and they were able to hide every single passport. The negotiations continued through the day into the night, and the plane's power supply started to dwindle. The air circulation had stopped working. Oh, my God. Yeah, so it's just getting worse. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, like, starting to feel feel it, like I'm in it. So throughout this whole time, though, Nirja is still taking care of the passengers. She's making sure that they were fed. She's making sure that they had water. And she's making sure that they were able to use the restrooms. So she's still keeping people calm. Oh, wow. Even though she's a hostage herself. Yeah, I mean, she's (laughs) equally terrified. So while the hijackers were not paying attention, Nirja tore a page from her own manual that had direct directions on how to open the exit door and deploy the emergency slide and she handed to handed it to a passenger who was sitting by the exit and she told them read this magazine carefully <laughs> oh wow yeah how would you feel if you were that fucking <laughs> passenger like, why? though i'd I be like why me up. i just want to survive this shit i don't want to be the hero <laughs> i would do it wrong i know i would fuck it up uh, i'd hand it to abby <laughs> you can handle this i, would hand I it can't to <laughs> So the auxiliary power in the plane finally goes down. And the lights in the cabin go off. Oh, God. Mm. So the hijackers at this time realize they are not going to get anywhere. So they decide to detonate an explosive device that they brought. The device malfunctions, however, and it sets off only a small explosion. And the <sighs> cabin just bursts into chaos. Oh no. I want to share a clip with you right now. Oh no. And this really set off the hijackers. Not only did their explosive belt not work, but now the whole cabin and all the passengers and crew were in a state of absolute chaos and madness. The hijackers began to shoot their guns at random and throw their hand grenades 
just randomly at passengers. But again, due to the lighting conditions and the fact that the cabin was in near darkness, the hijackers couldn't see what they were doing. So I couldn't imagine what that would be like. Mm, nope. Yeah. Just utter chaos, explosions, gunfire. Yeah. Darkness. Darkness. Ugh. Everybody's screaming, yum. Yeah, you're you're right. You you're this is a this is a terrifying story you're telling. Yeah. <laughs> so in the midst of what now is now chaos, Nirja runs and opens an exit door. The emergency slide, however, doesn't open. It doesn't deploy. It doesn't inflate. Why? So they were thinking because the plane, since the auxiliary power went out, it was gonna oh. have to something had to be done manually. And so the thing didn't deploy. Oh, my yeah. God. So another exit is opened by another flight attendant. That one doesn't deploy. Oh, my God. So Nirja just instructs passengers, jump. Just get out. It's about 20 feet to the I was going to say, it's really actually quite high. It is. But I would jump. Oh, I would jump. I'd be like, <laughs> fuck broken legs. Yeah. So the passenger, however, that Nirja gave the page from the manual successfully opens the door and that one deploys oh yeah thank so god <laughs> one of them deploys yes but and then so, everybody's going to be trying to crowd into that one <laughs> well due to the slide successfully deploying more people were able to get out quicker and safer mm, yeah nirja doesn't jump out instead she directs passengers to the exits and as nirja is helping three children get to get to the exit and get them out one of the hijackers notices that it's her that's directing people he points the gun at the children and Nirja jumps in the way. She blocks it with her body. Oh my God. And Nirja's shot. Oh. Nirja died just one day before her 23rd birthday. Oh, she was so young. Yeah. And after 17 hours, the passengers were free and the hijackers were seized. Nirja's crew escaped, and out of the 394 passengers, only 22 died. Yeah. Which is. I couldn't imagine Some how pretty you... impressive when they're just shooting when guns just in the shooting. air and throwing grenades and shit. So I'm going to share another clip with you. However, Nija Benot's heroism that day was quickly spread by her crew and passengers. Speaking of her bravery and leadership through the entire ordeal. From the fact that she initially warned the flight crew of the hijacking and they were able to escape, making the plane basically useless to the hijackers. From the fact that she hid all the US passports to getting all of the passengers out before she herself did to using her own body as a shield to save three children. So Nirja gave her life. I thought that was incredibly brave. She didn't have to do all of those things. She could have jumped out herself once that exit was open. Yeah. But she stayed, which I I don't think people do a lot in the world. No. They don't do the right thing. And just the act of putting her body in front of those children. Oh, my God. That is so incredibly brave and selfless. Very. And it makes me wonder about those kids. Like, who did they grow up to be mm -hmm. after having experienced that? I mean, obviously, it was a super traumatic event. But personally, if somebody gave their life so that I could be alive, I think I would have a whole different outlook on the world. Yeah. And would be compelled to do good things in order to sort of justify her death. Mm -hmm. To live that life. Yeah, that she them. couldn't live. Yeah. So after her death, the government of India posthumously awarded her the Ashoka Chakra Award, which is India's highest gallantry award for bravery in the face of the enemy during peacetime. Nirja is the youngest recipient of this award, and she was the first woman to ever receive it. Go, Nirja. In 2004, the Indian Postal Service released a stamp commemorating her. Her family and Pan Am International set up the Nirja Banat Pan Am Trust. The trust presents two awards every year, one for a flight crew member worldwide who acts beyond the call of duty, and also the Nirja Banat Award, which is reserved for an Indian woman who, when faced with social injustice, still persists. So I like that it's reserved, especially for a woman, you know? Yes. Nirja's brother, Anish, went to Washington, D.C. in 05 to receive the Justice for Crimes Award, 
awarded to Nirja posthumously. Is it posthumously? Yeah. Or some people say posthumously. Posthum- posthumously. Posthumously. <laughs> <laughs> posthumously. 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 As part of the annual Crime Rights Week at a ceremony held at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, in 06, she and the other Pan Am Flight 73 flight attendants were awarded the Special Courage Award by the U.S. Department of Justice. One of the children on board, who was only seven years old at Mm. this time, is now a captain for a major airline and has stated that Nirja has been his inspiration and that he owes every day of his life to her, which I thought was super cool. I tried to find out what his name was, yeah, and I couldn't find it. And I was wondering, is he one of the children that she saved? That's what I'm wondering, too. I was like, oh, I, I have in... to know. I know. <laughs> uh, so I got all of my er- information from a Aerotime Hub article called Inside a Hijack, the story of Nirja Banat. Um, that YouTube uh, video where I pulled the clips from is called The Heroine of the Hijack. I got some from Wikipedia and IndianWomenTimes.com. Nice. Okay. I'm glad you highlighted her story because I've never heard it. I had no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I knew, I mean, I knew that first of all, hijacking planes was like a thing in the eighties and nineties. What? I thought that was kind of why hijack such a big one too. Oh no, that's what they did. Really? It was, it happened a lot. That's why they had hijacking protocol. Oh, okay. <laughs> Cause it was like this, I think it was the seventies and eighties. It was a popular time and there were all kinds of terrorist groups. There was, I think, I think some Russian terrorist groups, some Israeli terrorist groups, like all kinds of people were doing that shit. Wow. Okay. It was like an easy thing to do. And so then they made the, the cockpits like harder to get into or something. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Anyway. And then, and then it was silent for a long time. We didn't have any problems like that. And then nine eleven happened. Yeah. And I- often the planes that were getting hijacked were not in the States. They were grounded somewhere else. And that's when they would get hijacked. Yikes. I thought she was very brave, especially for such a young woman. Yeah. It just seemed like a very, just kind of genuine and kind. and To have the wherewithal to save human lives at the age of 23 is, is pretty profound. Mm-hmm. I know some people, that they would not do that. Well, and I mean, uh, you're, you're kind of still developing, you know, in those years. And you just think about yourself a lot more. And that's okay. That's where yeah. you are developmentally. And it's also human instinct to yeah, run to away. Yeah, save yourself. <laughs> Fight or flight, right? Yeah. I I think um, it's just so incredibly brave, you know, because when you're in that moment, you don't know what you're going to do. No. Yeah. You never know. All right. Who do you have? Are you ready, madame? Ready. I'm going to tell you the story of Elizabeth Paratrovich. I don't know her. I didn't think so. <laughs> She was a civil rights activist who was central in the passage of the very first anti-discrimination law in U.S. history. What? Yeah. Wow. Okay. You ready for this? I'm ready. Okay. Elizabeth Wanamaker was born on July 4th, 1911 in Petersburg, Alaska. She was a member of the Coho Salmon Clan, which is part of the Raven Moiety of the Clingit Nation. There was an actually like the in written in Clingit was her clan name. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to pronounce that. And I apologize. But it means Coho Salmon. Okay. She was the daughter of a native woman and her mother's Irish brother-in-law. What? (laughs) Yeah. So that means that her mom had an affair with her sister's husband. Oh, jeez. Uh, And the two of them abandoned Elizabeth, (gasps) and she was left in the care of the Salvation Army. Oh, we haven't had any abandoned kids in a while, so. (laughs) (laughs) Let's start out with a heartwarming story of abandonment. (laughs) Elizabeth was then adopted by Andrew Wanamaker and his wife, Jean, both of whom were members of the Klingit tribe. Her adoptive father, Andrew, was a fisherman and a Presbyterian minister, and her mother was a basket weaver and a homemaker. Elizabeth grew up speaking both Klingit and English. They primarily lived in Sitka, though they moved to Claywalk when she was 10. Claywalk was a native village on the Prince of Wales Island. Her family was really poor, especially living in Claywalk. There's not a lot going on there. Uh, And the options for education were super limited. But this was not how it always was for Alaska natives. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Alaska as a territory prior to 
the U.S. involvement. Okay. Because it's really important, I think, to draw a distinction between how life was before and after U.S. involvement. Much like Hawaii was. Mm. Prior to Elizabeth's birth, Alaska had been a Russian territory, often called Russian America. The Russians had established a trade that reached far and wide and established the first seaport city known today as Sitka. The Russians seemingly mingled well with the indigenous communities and worked together with them and not against them. Most Alaska natives could read and write in two or more languages. Wow. Klingit, Russian, and English were the most common. The Russians relied heavily on the local indigenous folks' knowledge, talents, and expertise, and natives often held important positions in Russian trade operations. Russia ceded the territory of Alaska to the U.S. on March 30, 1867, for seven and a half million dollars in gold. And it's not really dollars, seven and a half million in gold. The treaty said this this is where things get shitty. Okay. So, in order for uh, Russia to sign this treaty, they assigned away this part. All inhabitants who did not reserve their natural allegiance to Russia, with the exception of members of uncivilized native tribes, were admitted to the enjoyment of all rights, advantages, and immunities of citizens of the U.S. This meant that the U.S. didn't recognize Alaska natives as citizens or even as equal human beings. Whoa. Yeah, so they were like, if you don't owe an allegiance to Russia, like if you're not a Russian person, yeah, you are allowed to be a citizen unless you're native. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty severe. It was their fucking land. Yeah. So the U.S. saw the natives as quote-unquote uncivilized. Oh, my God. <sighs> yeah. As white Americans moved into Alaska, segregation then became the law of the land. Natives were not allowed access to public accommodations, including restaurants, beauty parlors, movie theaters, and, of course, schools. One story, which took place just six years before Elizabeth was born, was particularly telling of what it was like at the time. A young Aleut girl living in Sitka wanted to attend the white public school because she was interested in playing music. She was half white, and they were a Christian family, which was apparently that was how you decided whether or not you were considered a U.S. citizen. You had to be uh, Christian, like full-on Christian, and okay. you also were supposed to be like part white. Okay. So she was like, and she petitioned the judge saying like, I fit these qualifications. Can you please let me attend public school? And the judge s denied her citizenship because, quote, she was not sufficiently civilized. Because she attended a fish camp every summer with her Aleut grandmother. Wow. That's all it took to be uncivilized. Uncivilized? Was to participate in anything that had to do with Native traditions. Wow. The differences between the Russian occupation of Alaska Territory and the U.S. was stark. Samuel C. Davis, a Haida man, wrote this in a news article in 1923. Why was it? If Russia owned Alaska, she made no laws to rule Alaska by. The only laws that I never, ever knew was the Tlingit and Haida laws. But now a great shadow hangs over the Tlingit and Haidas in this great land of Alaska. It's the shadow of the white men's greed. Wow. Russia never came and took our streams and trapping grounds from us. They never told us how we might catch salmon and when we might stop. And if we wanted a stick of timber, Russia never gave us permits. Those were the days when we were free. There were no judges to take our canoes from us. There was no thou shalt not in Alaska in those days. <laughs> that is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. And the Haida people, that's uh, Frida Dicing. Yes. Yeah. I, I, thought, I thought that was right. Mm -hmm. I was going to say that earlier, and then I was like, maybe I'm wrong about that. Mm -hmm. So it's the Klinga, Aleuts, um, Haida. Those are all like the main uh, Inipuak. This kind of discrimination also bled into the criminal justice system, where whites were often allowed to walk free for extreme violence, even murder, against Native folks. But Native folks were jailed for the slightest offenses, sometimes that were based entirely on a white person's narrative. Oh my gosh. Doesn't that sound an awful lot like Jim Crow South? Yes, absolutely. So in 1912, a group of progressive Native folks formed the Alaska Native Brotherhood. They were made up of young men who were educated and who were setting out to challenge the discriminatory practices. A founding member of the organization was none other than Elizabeth's father, 
Andrew Wanamaker. Just three years later, the Alaska Native Sisterhood was formed, which was a group of women working alongside the Alaska Native Brotherhood. In 1924, due in part to the efforts of the ANS and AMB, the U.S. Congress granted American citizenship to all Native Americans. Which, by the way, 1924, that's way too late. Yeah. But, so they say, okay, all Native folks are U.S. citizens. However, in practice, this was far from reality. Segregationist policies Mm -hmm. still ruled the Alaska Territory where Elizabeth and her family lived. So Elizabeth attended Native elementary schools when she was young because she was barred from attending white elementary schools. However, she was able to attend a public high school in Ketchikan, which was 70 miles east of Claywalk. So she had to travel 70 miles every day to and from to go to school. My God. That school had been integrated just a few years prior after a Clingit leader had sued the school board and won. Wow. Which was super rare. Elizabeth went on to go to college at Sheldon Jackson College in Sitka and then pursued further education at the Western College of Education in Bellingham, Washington, which is now part of Western Washington University. Such a beautiful school. While in college, Elizabeth met Roy Petrovich. The two married in 1939 when she was 20 years old. He was also Klingit of mixed Native and Serbian descent, oh. which was pretty common because yeah. the Russians well, had yeah. been living there. Okay, this makes sense because when I heard her last night, I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds pretty Russian. <laughs> the two decided to move back to Alaska together and they settled in Quaylock, which is that Native village that she had grown up in. He actually had grown up there too. So I had conflicting reports about when they met. Mm-hmm. One said they met in college when she, they were both attending college in, in Bellingham. But other parts said they went to high school together in Ketchikan. Oh, And that they maybe? knew each other through that. Huh. So I don't know where it was they actually met, but eventually okay. they married and they moved back to Claywalk or Quaylock. Roy worked in a cannery. Then he um, enrolled and became a police officer, a chief clerk, and the postmaster. Wow. <laughs> then Roy ran for and was elected to mayor in Quaylock and served four terms. He was the mayor? Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. However, Quaylock was a small town, and the couple wanted more opportunities to work for work and also for their children, and they also had their eye on a larger role in the political scene. <laughs> so by now, they've been married for 10 years, and the couple has three kids. They have one daughter named Loretta and two sons, Frank Allen and Roy Jr. The couple decided to move to Juneau, which was a booming metropolis, in 1941. They assumed Juno would provide a lot of advantages for their family. It was a large city, had nice homes, it had all the conveniences of being a city, and it had a really great public school system. Mm -hmm. Juno was the capital, obviously. Yeah. When they arrived, the family immediately faced discrimination. The Petroviches found a home in a nice neighborhood where they envisioned their kids playing and making friends with neighbors, going to school, living a nice life. The owners of the rental home were willing to lease the property to them until they discovered they were, quote, Indian. Hmm. No longer were they allowed to rent the home. Wow. That's discrimination. Yeah, no (laughs) shit. It is thought that this affront to her children, to their future as citizens, was the catalyst for Elizabeth to begin pushing for an end to discriminatory laws. She started first with pushing her husband more into the public eye. Um, Elizabeth said to him, this is your home and your people. Why don't you go out and help them? Wow. And Roy actually said this about Elizabeth. She was the manager. She saw the possibilities. She never once stepped out in front, but made it look like I made my own way. (laughs) At least he gave her the cred, man. That's awesome. (laughs) That's what I thought. I was like, at least he admits that he was, you know, that whole saying like behind every great man is a great woman or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he's letting everybody know. (laughs) Roy became involved with the Alaska Native Brotherhood, which was the big organization that her father had helped found, Mm -hmm. eventually rising to become the Grand Camp president. Elizabeth followed in Roy's footsteps, and she joined the Alaska Native Sisterhood, where she became the vice president. The two of them were a force to be reckoned with. (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) They were both really active and incredibly intelligent people. Like, they'd both been to college. They spoke multiple languages. They were super motivated and passionate about what they were doing. So they petitioned the Daily Alaska Empire, which was the largest newspaper in the Alaska Territory at the time, 
to formally object to the paper's practice of publishing the names and ages of Native children as front page news whenever they were in trouble with the police. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they, Call out. <laughs> they did not have a policy of doing this to white children. Oh, my God. Okay. Right? Okay. It's, it's an infuriating story, but very, like, she's awesome. So this wasn't nearly enough, right? Just challenging a paper. There were signs all over Alaska that declared natives to be second-class citizens. Signs outside of businesses declared things like no natives allowed or for whites only. And the worst of all, no natives or dogs allowed. Oh, jeez. That's what, the Nazis did that all the time throughout, like, Germany. Yeah. No Jews or dogs allowed. The discrimination was so widespread that even whites were caught up in it. <laughs> if someone so much as saw them with an Alaska native. So there was this woman named Henrietta Newton who was actually friends with Elizabeth. Henrietta had lived in Quaylock. She was the only white woman in the whole city oh, wow. or whole town. So they knew each other. So Henrietta Newton was a teacher who married um, a Clinket man. And she decided one day to stop into a beauty shop and make an appointment. Later that day, the shop owner saw her walking down the street with her native sister-in-law and two children. When Mrs. Newton arrived for her appointment the next day at the shop, the owner told her, we don't cater to Indian trade. After Mrs. Newton informed her that she was 100% Swiss, the owner backed down. But Mrs. Newton said, I wouldn't take her perm if she gave it to me for free. <laughs> exactly. That's why you don't support places like that. <laughs> the owner followed her out and apologized, but Mrs. Newton wouldn't hear it. Mm. By this point, World War II was in full swing, and many Native men turned out to fight for the United States during World War II. When the Perchoviches saw a sign in the Douglas Inn window that said, No Natives Allowed, they immediately sat down to pen a letter to Ernest Gruning. Gruning? Gruning. Grown. He's got a weird name. Okay. He was then the governor of the Alaska Territory. And they wrote this. The propriety of Douglas Inn does not seem to realize that our native boys are just as willing as the white boys to lay down their lives to protect the freedom that he enjoys. Hmm. The governor agreed. <laughs> and he decided to join forces with the Paratroviches. Gruning me began meeting with individual owners of businesses, trying to persuade them to take down their signs. But his efforts were futile. And he was most upset by the blatant discrimination of Native soldiers and their friends and family at places like the USO clubs and other facilities. Like, they would allow, they finally allowed Native soldiers to go into the USO clubs, but, like, if a sister of a soldier was there, they would kick, kick her out. Wow. For being Native. <laughs> One of the biggest hurdles, Elizabeth, the... Native Sisterhood and the Native Brotherhood and Governor Gruning faced was that the legislature in Alaska only met every other odd year and for only 60 days at a time. Every other? Every other odd year. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> to get anything done would obviously take years. Yeah. But Elizabeth was up for the challenge. She gathered five young ladies to lobby a senator who was against the anti-discrimination movement. All of the women that she gathered together were well-educated, stylish, and they came across as sophisticated and proper ladies. And so they told the senator, his name was Frank Whaley, they told him personal stories of their own actual experiences of being discriminated against, not being allowed in or being kicked out of places. The senator just couldn't believe that such good-looking women were being kicked out of establishments. <laughs> I guess if you got it, use it. Yeah. <laughs> well, like they were presenting themselves yeah, as presenting we themselves. look like ladies. Yeah. And you're, you know, you look at us and you see fine ladies and yeah. we are those things. Yeah. We're still being kicked out. Yeah. We're being dehumanized. In addition to lobbying individual senators, Elizabeth and Roy, then leaders, they now they were now the leaders of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Alaska Native Sisterhood. So they're both the leaders. They sat down with Governor Gruning and worked on drafting legislation to outlaw discrimination. Wow. Unfortunately, this first attempt failed after a bitter fight on the legislative floor. Roy said that this was his first lesson in double cross politics because there are people who he had talked to personally who said that they would vote in favor of the law and, and then, then they, they didn't. didn't. They would not get another chance to fight for an anti discrimination law for another two years. Mm hmm. 
In that time, the Paratroviches traveled across the territory of Alaska, far and wide, appealing to Alaska Natives to turn out to vote in the next election and to get more Native Alaskans elected into office, which would increase their chances of passing an anti-discrimination law. Their campaign worked. Frank Paratrovich, Roy's brother, and Andrew Hope, a boat builder, were both Alaska Natives elected to seats in the legislature. So on a February afternoon in 1943, the legislature heard arguments for and against the proposed anti-discrimination law. The whole place was fucking packed to the gills. People were even standing on chairs in the back just to try to be able to see. Jeez. All of the members of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood and a whole lot of other Native folks came out from the tribes to watch what was about to happen. Among the spectators was, of course, Elizabeth, mm -hmm. styled to perfection, <laughs> knitting. Oh, <laughs> she listened. that's picturesque. So the bill passed the House easily with little debate, and they knew that would happen. They mm -hmm. had that one on lock. They knew that their real test was going to be in the Senate. So once it gets to the Senate, a heated two-hour discussion begins. Senator Frank Whaley, the same man who years earlier they had lobbied and who said, oh, but you look like real ladies. Mm -hmm. He said that he didn't want, this is in his testimony in front of everybody. He says, I don't want to sit next to an Eskimo in a theater because they smell. <gasps> Literally said that. Literally said that. Oh, my God. On the floor of the legislature in the Alaska Territory. Then Senator Tolbert Scott said this. He was speaking about how, like, really the problem is not natives and whites. The problem is what he called mixed breeds. Hmm. Mixed breeds mixed are the mixed breeds. Yeah, you ready? Mixed yeah. breeds are the source of the trouble. It is they only who wish to associate with the whites. Certainly, white women have done their part in keeping the races distinct. If white men had done as well, there would be no racial feeling in Alaska. Wow. He's talking like it's almost like animal breeding or something like you could be talking about a pedigree of dogs. That's right. Disgusting. And again, all of the native folks in the gallery are listening to everything that this fucking asshole is saying. Ugh. So there are more and more of these kind of inflammatory comments. And all the while, Elizabeth is listening and knitting. Not showing us, she's just cool as a cucumber, like nothing is showing on her face. <laughs> I would be like red and <laughs> spitting. I mean, I would not be able to handle it. I would not be able to either. So eventually, because he's the leader of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, Roy is asked to comment. Not her. After a number of questions, first, grilling him on why he was qualified to speak to the, these men, which wow. is patronizing enough. Yeah. He's finally able to plead his case. So he said, you know, hey, the Democratic Party has already adopted anti-discrimination as their platform. So half of you in this place are Democrats. So you should automatically want to vote for it. Mm -hmm. And also, I, it has been well, none of you in here are denying that there's discrimination. So you're, you're allowing there the idea that discrimination is part of the law here. So he said... Either you are for discrimination or you are against it accordingly as you vote on this bill. Basically, the history will remember you based on this. Mm -hmm. One of the most vehement opponents of the law, the bill, the proposed law, was a man named Alan Shattuck, who said this. This one is rough. Who are these people, barely out of savagery, who want to associate with us whites with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind us? Fuck. <laughs> what makes you, what are you, fucking shit ice cream? Like, what the, the caucasity of it? Oh, uh. uh, that, what, who are these people barely out of savagery who want to associate with us whites with 5,000 years of recorded civilization? <gasps> oh, the incorrectness, <laughs> the, the racism is just so, uh, it's so, so frustrating. Saturated. Ugh. So after all of the men were heard, the Senate asked if any, this was par for the course in the legislature at the time. They asked if anyone else would like to voice their views. And this is when Elizabeth Petrovich, mm. then president of the Alaska Native Sisterhood, said she would like to speak. What'd you say? What'd you say? <laughs> Those who remember her today said that Elizabeth had a presence about her. When she walked in a room or chose to speak, people shut the fuck up and listened. Mm. 
She commanded and demanded attention. So when she addressed the legislature, it was like a pin could drop. So in response to that vulgar declaration by Alan Shattuck, Elizabeth said this, I would not have expected that I, who am barely out of savagery, would have to remind gentlemen with 5,000 years of recorded civilization behind them of our Bill of Rights. <laughs> I love that she took her, his words and just shot him down Spun with it. them. Elizabeth went on, and she, was, she described the discrimination that she, her husband, and her children had faced when they arrived in Juneau. She talked about not being able to rent this house. She talked about not being able to go into establishments. And then she added this. There are three kinds of persons who practice discrimination. First, the politician who wants to maintain an inferior minority group so that he can always promise them something. Yes. Mm -hmm. Second, the Mr. and Mrs. Jones who aren't quite sure of their social position and who are nice to you on one occasion and can't see you on others. Mm -hmm. Depending on who they're with. Mm -hmm. Third, the great Superman who believes in the superiority of the white race. (laughs) And it's true. It's true. Number two, that's that white moderate mm-hmm. fucking King talked all about. Of course, Shattuck had a response for her, right? He yeah. couldn't let that go. Oh, hell no. Oh, yeah. How dare she? Oh, and you know the guy who thinks he's so high and mighty and mm-hmm. superior with yeah. his 5,000 years of recorded civilization? <laughs> he asked if she thought that the bill would eliminate discrimination. Do you think this bill's going to eliminate discrimination? If we pass this, do you think that discrimination is just going to go away? <laughs> Which was a deliberate attempt to get her to admit that laws don't change minds. Mm. Like, obviously, once you pass a law, that doesn't mean discrimination goes away. But she was on to him. She was like, I know what you're going to say. I got an answer <laughs> As for you. As my grandma used to say, I got your number. <laughs> she said this. Do your laws against larceny and even murder prevent those crimes? No law will eliminate crimes. But at least you as legislators as legislators, can assert to the world that you recognize the evil of the present situation and speak your intent to help us overcome discrimination. Holy shit, that is calling him out. It's like, no, motherfucker, it's not going to stop. But to recognize and have something in place mm-hmm. where if you cross that line, you, it's not okay. Yes. <laughs> That's the whole fucking point, right? <laughs> I, I get that argument a lot from students when we talk about guns. They're like, well, gun control laws aren't going to stop guns from being passed around. No, but it would sure fucking help because it would be against the law. And mm-hmm. if you got caught, you would go to jail. And people would stop maybe doing it because they don't want to go to jail. Maybe. <laughs> when Elizabeth finished, the entire place erupted in applause. Folks were cheering and shouting and people were crying tears. The Daily Alaska Empire wrote that Elizabeth, quote, shamed the opposition into a defensive whisper. (laughs) (laughs) Just FYI, Roy and Elizabeth were the only two people who testified in favor of the bill. Wow. The Senate passed the bill, 11 to 5, because she's a badass. (laughs) And it was signed into law on February 16th, 1945. This was the first anti-discrimination law in the United States passed nearly 20 years before the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 14 years before Alaska was even a state. Whoa. Mm Mm-hmm. That night, Roy and Elizabeth danced the night away at the Baranoff Hotel, a place that just a day before they could not go. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) So after this, Elizabeth advocated for the Red Cross, helping folks across the country and the world receive access to care. Which I was like, of course you did. (laughs) In 1954, Roy Sr. accepted a position with the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs and moved the family to Oklahoma. Just two years later, Elizabeth discovered that she had breast cancer. Oh, no. The family moved back to Alaska to be close to their families and tribes. Elizabeth died on December 1st, 1958, at the age of 47. That's young. Too young. Really young. She was buried beneath a Sitka spruce in Juneau's Evergreen Cemetery. In 1988, the Alaska legislature declared February 16th, the day that the Anti-Discrimination Act was signed, as Elizabeth Petrovich Day. Elizabeth's husband, Roy, was looking forward to celebrating that first official Elizabeth Petrovich Day, but he died a week prior. He was buried in the plot next to her in the Juneau Evergreen Cemetery. 
An award was established in her name by the Alaska Native Sisterhood, and the first winner was a woman named Carol Jorgensen, who created cross-cultural training curriculum for the Department of Fish and Game. And it turned out that Carol was Elizabeth's second cousin. (laughs) Oh, jeez. One of the galleries in the Alaska State Legislature is now named the Elizabeth Pertovich Gallery. In 2009, there was a documentary about her life, and it aired on PBS called For the Rights of All, Ending Jim Crow in Alaska. On February 16th, 2019, so February 16th was the day that that Mm anti-discrimination law was passed. So that was also the day, just this year, that a biography of hers was published called Fighter in Velvet Gloves, Alaska Civil Rights Hero, Elizabeth Perichovich. It was written title. it was written by a woman named Annie Buchi Buch Ever. Yeah, Buch Ever. Okay. And just last week, on October fifth, oh. twenty nineteen, the US Mint Chief announced that Elizabeth Perichovich will appear on the tail side of the twenty twenty Native American dollar coin. Ooh. I'm gonna get me one of those. Yes. I want to end with some information about what her children went on to do because I found this really fascinating. Frank Allen Perchovich followed in his parents' footsteps and worked in public service for his whole life. He was a U.S. Marine and then eventually the superintendent of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Frank Allen spent his entire life in Alaska where he passed away in 2010. Loretta Marie Montgomery was a long-distance phone operator who married a man named Bob Montgomery in 1959. He was in the Air Force. They had lived in Germany and -and so-and-so and... They eventually lived in Seattle and then settled in Moses Lake, Washington. Oh. Which is just like like an hour away from us. Yeah. Where they raised their four children. She also died in 2010, which I was like, oh, that's a sucky year for you guys. Yeah. Roy Jr. went on to become the first Alaska native to be registered as a professional civil engineer and started his own successful engineering firm called Petrovich, Nottingham, and Drage with offices in Anchorage, Juneau, and Seattle. Cool. In 1965, Roy designed the first original Brotherhood Bridge, honoring the Alaska Native Brotherhood that his grandfather co-founded. In 1999, Roy retired from engineering to pursue his love of art. He was also an artist. (laughs) That's cool. He runs Raven Works Art Studio in Gig Harbor, Washington. Wow. Yeah. (laughs) Roy also wrote a children's book in 2016 called Little Whale based on a story about his grandfather. Oh, that's so beautiful. When I realized that two of her children lived in this state, I was like, I want to get in touch with this family. (laughs) But I wasn't able to in time. So if you're listening to this and you're a descendant of Elizabeth Petrovich, I want to hear from you. And I would love to record something and have you your voice heard on our show. So my sources were Wikipedia and a really cool project called Alaskool. <laughs> and it's a um, project that was put on by Alaska Native educators who created this whole website of honoring the history of Alaska Natives. And she was featured in the New York Times Overlooked Obituaries last oh, year. Yeah. This actually in last March. So, Oh, it's wonderful. Gosh. She sounded like a firecracker. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she looked so much like my grandmother. Really? It was shocking. Whoa. My grandmother I never met because she died when my mom was only four years old. Um, but from, I mean, if I showed you the picture side by side, you'd be like, holy shit. Whoa. It was it was remarkable how much they looked like each other. But it, she she had just this beautiful regal look about her. She always had her hair coiffed in those like bouffant mm-hmm. 40s hairdos, perfectly dressed, very nice clothes. Yeah, she – Wow. And she – like there was other people who talked about – um, like women who talked about like if you needed anything, you went to her. Like if you needed to figure out how to feed a large family on a small budget, she would tell you how to do it. If you needed to figure out some, like, she even, like, taught a lot of Alaska Native women how to cook spaghetti. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just, like, really random stuff I found on that Alaska cool website that was really, yeah. like, personal and specific. But I was like, I'd love to include all of that, but we'd be here forever. <laughs> so wow. I loved her story. I love her story, too. That was great. I'm um, glad we ended on a high note. <laughs> I am, too. Although I'm going to bring it down for just one second, but it's kind of a high note. So this morning I found out that a friend of mine died. Oh. Um, I had known him for a long time. I knew him in college, and his name was Tony Little Owl. And he was a really great, great, great guy. And everybody, if you went to Montana State University during the time between 2000 and 2007, you probably knew him at some point. 
And uh, when I got there, he was just so welcoming and kind. Uh, He had been an RA and just was the kind of person that you could turn to if you needed anything. Mm -hmm. And his qualities were so well known and so profound that he was actually crowned homecoming king at the university. Wow. And he was the first Native American to ever become homecoming royalty at Montana State University. Wow. So he died um, a couple of days ago, and I just found out this morning. And I'm really sorry for his family and his friends, but I thought, I'm already talking about this incredible Native person. I should mm-hmm. highlight my friend Tony, who, in his own way, um, had impacted a lot of lives. That's awesome. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's, um, it's you know, what a week. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, let's <laughs> start a new one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. TikTok, let's get yeah. there. <laughs> thank you, every- thank you everybody for listening today. And uh, I know it was kind of a it was kind of a rough one, but I think we we did it. We yeah, did it well, good yeah. job. I liked both of these stories. Yeah, good, good job, Rita. Air five douche. <laughs> <laughs> did you say douche? I went douche like like if. <laughs> I am done. Okay. We're, we are done. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everybody for listening. And thank you, Lucas, for your editing. And also to Jennifer Finch for providing our lovely theme music. We'll talk to you again next week. All right, guys. Thanks for hanging in there. <laughs> Till next time. cheesy thumbs up (laughs) you're welcome